Friday at 7 p.m., your weekend sports on Talk Radio Europe with the Friday Sports Bar. You tuned into Talk Radio Europe and the Friday Night Sports Bar coming to you live from the Talk Radio Europe studios. Stay with us for the next hour. Roger Federer advances to yet another Wimbledon men's final. Andy Murray is on court. We'll give you an update what's happening there. Silverstone is a washout in free practice today, but Lewis Hamilton goes quickest. Olympic and world record holder Usain Bolt is beaten in the 100 and 200 metres by his compatriot Johan Blake in the Jamaican trials. And a very special guest in the studio this evening and on the phone. Former Tottenham Hotspur manager David Pleat joins us at about half past the hour. Former Welsh international John Hartson joins us on the phone as well. And not to mention Stuart Joseph, of course, who joins me on a weekly basis. Stay with us for this next hour of sport. This is the Friday Night Sports Bar. Friday Sports Bar with Dom Aldworth. Well, good evening once again and welcome to the Friday Night Sports Bar, wherever you might be in your car, on the internet, wherever you are in the world. Um, without further ado, it's a great pleasure to welcome yet another top sports personality and David Pleat. Good evening, sir, and welcome to the Friday Night Sports Bar. Yeah, hi, thanks very much. Nice to have the invitation. And of course, Stu, good evening and welcome. Hi, good evening. Good to have you back as usual. Nice you've been on the road sort of here and there and we've been doing phone calls while you've been doing your taxi runs. It's great to have you back in the studio. Uh, gentlemen, before we press on with the conversation, um, as already mentioned, Roger Federer is through to yet another Wimbledon final. A tremendous result there for him over Novak Djokovic in four sets. But the big news is at, mo at the moment is Andy Murray is currently two sets to one up against Joe Wilfred Zonga. Uh, two, two games to one up now, or one, one two down, I beg your pardon, in the fourth set. So uh, a marathon match taking place there. Let's hope it goes to five sets uh, because Andy Murray's got a tremendous record in five sets, especially in the Grand Slams. Can he make it through to his first Wimbledon final? Um, let's turn our attention back to football, gentlemen. David, that is why you're in the studio this evening. Um, and as mentioned, it is a wonderful pleasure to have somebody with your experience in here. Uh, we have to first talk. I know it's slightly old news now, but uh, yet another major championship victory for the Spanish national side uh, on Sunday in the Euro 2012. One of the great football teams of all time. Yeah, there's no question about that. I had the good fortune to see great teams. I've been to several World Cups and uh, I've seen Brazilians at their best. Um, when I was a young man, of course, uh, Real Madrid were a great team. And we've seen other great teams. Arsenal's Invincibles were a great team. Um, but to be great... You have to be outstanding over a period of time, and that's what the Spanish have proved. And also, of course, what they've also proved and disproved to many people is that their football isn't boring. They have an end product, they know how to penetrate, and you don't have to have what may be called old-fashioned positions of a centre-forward or a wide right player, outside right, outside left, that football has evolved. And if you've got clever people with a brain who make good angles for passing, and you have people who are prepared to run forward at times, whether they are natural forward players or come from midfield, then you can be a very exciting team. And they have a group of players who've come together all together at a particular period of time in the history of Spanish football who are all outstanding players who can distribute a ball and make movements off the ball to make a wonderful patchwork of brilliant football. I mean, that, that was actually a question I was going to ask you after that, is all the media, lots of the media were making uh, light of exactly that, that Spain play boring football. But how could one view aside, I mean, Stu, you could come in on this, you know, playing boring football when you've got 75% of the ball. It just simply means the other team are not good enough to take it away from you. How can that be boring? Well, not everybody said that. That's what the press was saying. Because, Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't get it. I really don't, because I can watch that football every week. I really do. I, as David said, I love the fact that people don't play, that they can play in any position. I mean, if you saw the second goal, that uh, Spain scored. I mean, Alba ran about 30 yards off the ball. I mean, it was an incredible goal, the finish, the pace and everything. If that's boring football, fetch it on. Yeah, of course. We're, I mean, we've had also the great Dutch teams as well, Holland, but only for a brief period, but they were wonderful teams under Rines Michels. I think the beauty of the uh, Spanish team is they know when to accelerate the pace of the game when to make the clever passes, the subtle passes, like the pass that Xavi made, which set Alba in for that vital second goal. 
that type of football is, is fantastic. I will say this, in the semi-final against Portugal, I thought the Portuguese tactics were outstanding, the way they condensed the space and prevented Spain from making the, getting into the grass behind their last defender. They squeezed the space, playing without a natural front player who wanted to run on behind, like a Torres, for example. Uh, Portugal survived for quite a long period and played very well against Spain. But Spain were the best. And in the end, although a lot of the press were saying before the competition that their time now was elapsing and it was time for the Germans to take over, it wasn't the case. Spain have proved once again that if you can handle the football in all areas of the field, regardless of what position you're playing, then you come up trumps. And it's a great lesson for English teams who tend to play a little bit in straight lines, a little bit direct football, frenetic football at times. Spain taught us you can be patient and win. You said acceleration. of They can accelerate their game when they need to do. They did exactly that in the semi-finals against Portugal, albeit very late in the, in the of extra time, where they just suddenly came up, uh, completely dominated it, and that's when the Portuguese looked at their most valuable, wasn't it? Yes, I think the Portuguese were tiring a little bit by then. I think Ronaldo had had a couple of chances to uh, put them in a good position where they felt good, they were in front. Uh, it wasn't to be. Um, Ronaldo still did very well overall in the tournament particularly in the previous game. But, uh, no, you know, no one's going to challenge at the moment. Spanish, they're worthy champions. David, can I ask you, is, could you take 11 players out of the UK and, and, and train them to be like the Spanish? Have we got the quality in our youth and our setup to play like that? I think there's all sorts of types of players. You know, there's specific players for specific positions in England. For example, the best example I can give you is the Carroll, the centre forward. Very good in the air, outstanding in the air. He's got a wonderful headed goal. But his all-round game... Is, is, is restricted to that one outstanding quality. I think what you have with the Spanish players, they all are comfortable on the ball. That's the first thing. They're not the tallest team in the world, although Ramos and Pique have size. They are clever players who are unselfish. And that, that's the beauty of the Spanish team. Even though there's Basques and Spaniards and Real Madrid and Barcelona, you have that wonderful mixture, but Del Bosque kept the wonderful camaraderie in the team. Uh, and we've seen before how international teams, particularly the Dutch, have had rivalries amongst their groups of players. But no, there is no doubt about it. Could, in could England play the same way? If we were to go right into the young schoolboys and the youth level and say this is the way forward, but the, the, we, we, follow, we follow trends. I mean, I remember Howard Wilkinson coming back in 91 from youth tournaments when we set up the um, academies. Um, we had to play with all of a sudden where we, we played with two strikers, you know, Toshak and Keegan, you, you know, I'm just giving you an example. Most teams played with two strikers all the way through. Um, but he came back, two, the, in the European game, two wide players and one up the middle. So in the end, when you were defending, it became almost 4-5-1. So he only had one up there and he became isolated, that player. I personally liked Italy because early on, Cassano played up front with Balotelli. They played two up, despite playing three at the back in the first game. They had two up the field, which gives you an outlet. And sometimes when you come under pressure, particularly against teams of the brilliance of Spain, if you've got that outlet, sometimes you have to react to the other team's ascendancy by playing that longer ball or longer pass to try and challenge the team that's got the greater technical players. But in England, for sure, no, since we've lost the likes of the Hoddles and the Gascoins, the cleverer midfield players, the Waddles, who could actually beat a man and bring someone out the game to, to make the numbers, to overload. Until you've got that type of player, we're going, to find, we're going to find it very difficult. But can you make players like that? Yes, I think you can, but it's practice, it's practice. And you know, it's easier to practice in the sunshine than it is in some of the conditions in England. <laughs> Absolutely. Gentlemen, just to inter interrupt you very briefly, bring you up to speed with Andy Murray. Uh, Andy Murray is currently serving to go 4-1 up in the fourth set. He certainly has one foot in that final, so hopefully he can continue in that form. Uh, David, uh, obviously we've spoken about the players in the Euro Championships. Time for a bit of management, something again that you've got a tremendous amount of experience. Uh, we, we do have a caller on the line. Before I ask you that question, we'll... Uh, We'll bring this caller in if we can. Uh, good evening and welcome to the Friday Night Sports Bar. Good, uh, good evening. It's nice to know we've got a professional on the, on, on the radio this evening. <laughs> um, I've missed the last two weeks and I'm glad that there's an expert there to answer a question for me. Um, I, I have great concerns about the England team. My name's Steve from Malaga, sorry. I'm sorry if I didn't give my name. Yeah. Um, my, my name's Steve from Malaga. I've got, I've got great concerns about 
why football has never moved forward. Why is it that there's so much um, emphasis placed on stamina and running and there's no interest by anybody, it seems, to uh, progress the skill side of the game? And do you think that the money's spoiling the game? Well, I certainly think, without expanding on it, Steve, that money is spoiling the game, the game as we knew it, the game, we don't want to be too cynical as we get older, but uh, there's still some great players in the game and there's still some great teams, particularly club sides, the top of the Premiership, for sure, and, uh, and, in, and in Europe in the Champions League. Um, but I will say this, power and pace did take over the English game, no question about that, to the detriment, for sure, of the English game. Technical players are coming back. Smaller boys weren't encouraged. Bigger, stronger boys were encouraged who could run quickly. And what has happened is, because teams like Arsenal, who've been criticised for oh, what could we call overplaying and not uh, taking opportunities to shoot when they might have done, with the likes of the Fabregas's, those type of players, the ball players who, who work the ball, they are slowly coming back because the example is set from the top. Spain has set a wonderful example over the last uh, years and people will uh, follow that example because we all look to emulate the best and I feel that maybe the more enlightened coaches in England who haven't the fear factor uppermost in their mind because they all worry about losing their jobs so they look to the most expedient way of playing and sometimes that is get the ball in the other defensive third, the opposition, as quick as possible. That has been proved by Spain that not necessarily that will get you to the top. But you have to have the players to play it. I do believe, Steve, that they yeah. will encourage the cleverer player in England more so than the powerful, pacey man which we've done in the past. Wait, wait, it leads to my second question, then. I mean, you're more diplomatic than me. I'm a Liverpool fan. And um, I sit there and watch Andy Carroll day in and day out. Um, my nickname for him is Lobber. As far as I'm concerned, he's got no pace and uh, he might be able to jump, but I'm not even sure if he's a great head of a ball. We'll discuss it another time. Mm. What bothers me is, is that we've now got a new manager come on board and it must have been seen before that either if, if he was injured, that they'd need to, to sort of help progress him on for England and for Liverpool. But for me, he just shows there's no... There's no skill in the man, and uh, I just wonder why the powers that be that run our club can continue to play with just one striker, because we're the only club in, uh, in, in, the, in the Premier League that has two strikers. And I'd also like to add, just as an aside, is that um, I may have to give Dom a big heads up, because uh, he said that Mr Lender would improve Andy Murray, and he may have done so. Yep, let's hope so. It looks like it. Well, he's okay. actually just broken back, hasn't he, Tonga? But he's still got one foot in there. Let's hope he can continue. Yeah. Steve, to make your point about Carroll, I think he yeah. needs a partner. I think, like all uh, tall centre-forwards who are good at heading the ball down, I'll give you an example. Uh, Crouch did very well with, uh, with Van der Vaart, then Adebayor, perhaps, with Van der Vaart. Someone who can make a chance for someone else. I, th I think uh, striking partnerships uh, are good particularly if they can respond. Well, Beck and Rooney did quite well towards the end for Manchester United. You've seen the Tottenham situation. Just to go back, it depends on the philosophy and the mentality of the team. I played with one striker at one time at Tottenham, Clive Allen. Only one striker, but he scored 49 goals. The reason was because the whole mentality of the team was an attacking philosophy. And if you haven't got that, then it's hard, particularly for the one striker. As it happens, Carroll's control of the ball is not yet at top quality. He loses the ball too often, and therefore... Thank you very much. Yes, Thank he does. Thank you very much. And therefore, he's striving to regain the ball, and that's why he gives a lot of free kicks away, because he's not humiliated, but he's annoyed with himself, and then he goes and gives a foul away, trying to retrieve the ball. But he is good in the air. But to be good in the air, you've got to have a big supply of ball. And I've got to worry about Liverpool. Liverpool have never, ever played that way. Brendan Rodgers does not play that way. He likes to work the ball from the back. He splits his centre-backs. He has his deep midfield coming for the ball. And I'm not sure whether, Rogers, whether uh, Carroll will find it easy in Rodgers' system. I, th I think if he's going to work the system, he's going to have to play with a partner for Carroll. Bear in mind one last thing. Carroll is still very young. It's not his fault they've paid all that money for him. He's still very young. If he's concerned about his career and not satisfied too easily because of the money, 
then he might work hard at his game and improve his game. But as, as an aerial man, he is very good. But how you combine those elements in the way Liverpool play, and they used to play, and Brendan Rodgers' philosophy would be very... Well, it's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Well, well, one last quickie for you, then. Just yeah. a real quickie. Don't you think, then, that playing with a big man is old-fashioned, bearing in mind we've seen the Hollands and the, and the Germanys and the Spain, they don't use a big man? It's, it's a great... Honestly, it's a great point you made, but if you've got a big man who is very, very good in the air and you've got people who are good at crossing the ball and that guy can get an advantage so, so easily over other people because he's so good in the air, then that is part of football. And it, therefore, it is, a, it is a weapon that you use. You can own, what you do is you, you, you have the players at this disposal and sometimes, of course, your recruitment policy, you don't buy those type of players if you don't want those type of players. But when you join a club, if you've got someone who's very, very good in the air, then, and, and has cost a lot of money, then sometimes it's, it's wise to try and maximise his qualities. And maybe you try and do that, sell him on, and then go back to the way you want to play yourself as manager. Can I just ask you, a, sorry, Steve, I just want to butt in there. Um, uh, when we had Crouchy at Spurs, he laid off fabulous balls to Van der Vaart, who's scoring loads of goals. Um, and you haven't discussed uh, Ciaris, because he could play alongside Carroll and do exactly the same job. It, it could do, but it looks to me as though they like to play... That Suarez is very much an individualistic player. He was, certainly was in Holland. He likes his own dribbles. I mean, he tries to score goals from the byline at times. You know, ridiculous goals. Scores some, of course, but misses some. Can get accused of being selfish by hitting the side netting. I don't know whether Suarez is a good... What you want to the second striker is someone who plays what I call straightforward, simple football, but has a brain. If you see sometimes the, the way Rooney and Welbeck play, I'll give that as an example. Rooney will get in line with Welbeck when the ball is delivered and leave the ball, he'll spin. And Welbeck will play the ball and Rooney will spin for the second pass. Now, to do that, you've got to have two brains thinking together, but, but playing straightforward football, it's clever... But it's simple. And there was yeah, but he's got more pace, though, hasn't he, Welbeck? And he's a better all-round footballer than Mr Carroll, so... Yes, you're right, Steve. I mean, you're, you're, you're right. But uh, let's give the gentleman time and let's not be too harsh on him. Uh, uh, so I, I can't afford to wait that long, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting well, old and uh, yeah. it would be nice to see us in the top three before I die. Yeah, well, well you've, had, you've had your share over the past. You shouldn't be too greedy. Thank you very much for your time, sir. You, you spoke very intelligently. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much for your call there, Steve. Uh, uh, good, some good questions there. Fascinating to hear your insight on that one there, David. And just going back to what I was going to discuss with you before uh, we had Steve on the line about management and, of course, the appointment of Roy Hodgson caused a little bit of a stir um, because the, the job was very much expected to go to Harry. Um, it, it didn't. I was suitably impressed, uh, and I think that a lot of the press was suitably impressed with the way he conducted himself. He did the ahead of the, uh, the, the game against Italy. He even conducted the press conference in Italian at one stage, which I actually found most impressive, something completely different to what we've seen from an England manager in the past. What did you make of Roy Hodgson's performance uh, at the helm of England? Yeah, there's no question about it. As a, as, a, as a man of culture and as a man of experience, I mean, I remember 94 in Chicago speaking to Roy when he had the Swiss national team. He made his name outside this country. He's an educated man, learnt languages, was a very poor player, was a non-league player, went abroad and cultivated his coaching skills and educated himself and he'd done very well. I, th I always thought he would get the job because he's the type of diplomatic figure that the FA really re would require. I have, he's only had 50 odd days to look at that group and bear in mind the group that he took, we only had five world class players or maybe six but five, Hart, Terry, Ashley Cole, Gerard, and Rooney. The rest average players but those five would have got in any team not simultaneously but in different national teams around the world so he's going with a slight handicap of players and as he says only 30 percent of the players that he can pick are playing currently in the premiership teams because the rest of 70 percent are from other countries so it's not easy however i thought he did quite well but i also thought which i which i I've known from my own experience, sometimes you can get caught in the headlights as a manager, as a coach, sitting on the bench. Sometimes you don't see the whole picture. Sometimes you need someone up there, a bit higher, telling you and saying, look, we've got a problem here. So-and-so is continually beating so-and-so. We've got to get double cover on. So-and-so, for them, is dictating the game. We've got to get closer to him. 
I have to say, I didn't think he dealt with Perlow very well at all in that game. And from half an hour onwards, he completely ran that game from almost a quarterback position. He was very deep. He was uh, knocking balls around the field far too comfortably. And I thought, and this is where foreign managers are often better than English managers, and he's had the experience, so he, I would have thought he might have you know, done it, and certainly experience in AC Milan. I thought... As that game developed, he was asking Rooney to do far too much work. Rooney was running all over the place, trying to contain Perlow, trying to help Welbeck when we got the ball forward, which we didn't do too often against Italy. But I thought we should have changed the system and, and immediately gone, as soon as Perlow took over that game, kept the four at the back, played a three, a one and a two, made someone stand, not Rooney or Welbeck, but another player, the foremost man of a midfield, three, and stand on Perlow. Do you think even that... to take him out the game, even not to contribute when we had the ball, but to stop Perlow receiving the ball? We were unable to stop Perlow receiving the ball, and he dictated the tempo of that game absolutely, completely. Okay, penalties, but in truth, it wasn't a game of penalties. It was a game that we lost absolutely convincingly. We lost it so clearly. But surely that should have been a tactic. He, he should have employed at the start of the game. Perlow had a marvellous season for Juventus. He was the reason why Juventus won the Serie A title. That's a great point, because all the coaches in England, the coaches, and I'm not talking about the press, because the press gave Roy now, all the coaches in England suggested the same thing. Why wait after half an hour? They had all the scouting reports. He knew all about Perlow. We did not do anything about Perlow. You're quite right. Fantastic season he did. I watched a lot of Serie A, followed that throughout the season, and, and absolutely, I mean, Perlow was pulled all the strings for Juventus in uh, it, an unbeaten season, I think it was. Uh, unbeaten, they lose never, unbeaten, never lost a never, game. Never lost a game. And six or seven of the team were from Juventus, so Pandelli did a fantastic job. Mm. He kept the nucleus of that uh, team. And um, they, they did well, Italy. I think the first game against Spain was an interesting game too. The, the, final, they just, uh, the final was a game too far. For them. Tottenham Hotspur, we have to talk about it, of course, uh, because of both of your backgrounds uh, from that side of uh, London. Um, no more Harry Redknapp there, a new era in Spurs. Uh, Stu, I suppose this is something you'd like to talk to David about. Um, you know, what do you guys make of this? Is there general, uh, a lot of excitement at Wine Hard Lane about all of this? Um, take it away, guys. Well, I'm excited now, obviously, being a Spurs supporter all my life and, um, and having David sitting by the right side of me. Um, all I want to know is, is that this new manager going to be up to the job? Well, I think he's got a wonderful opportunity because he's um, had the experience of comparative failure at Chelsea and you learn from disappointments. You don't learn as much from successes. But did fantastic in Portugal. Wonderful record. And I would have thought the experience at Chelsea can only have done him good. Uh, came to a bad ending for him. But I think there will be a fascination at Spurs now particularly when they see the signings that come in so it, it shows the board are going to be financially strong to is give that positive? Opportunity. It's going to be oh, it looks very positive at the moment for sure regarding signings so I, I do feel that he's got every opportunity he's been named as head coach he will bring in a couple of his friends who he is comfortable with which will be another advantage to him he's had the experience now of a, of a premiership football so he'll have a little bit more idea of, of how it's played and who's the good players and where um, so he's not coming in cold um, I, I think it's a very interesting appointment it's strange for one so young he's 34 I think I took Tottenham I think I was about might have been 41 I think when I took over to Tottenham I was, I was quite young um, but now he's 34 so that's very young but, um, you know, if he's good enough, he's young enough. It's, 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 an, it's a fascinating one. I don't think there'll be any... Uh, a lot of it will depend on the results, of course. We know that. And the cynics will say, well, if he loses a few, they'll soon have him out. Um, they'll give him every opportunity. Um, and I, th I think the supporters, over a period of time, will, will get behind him. And the most important thing is, first game is at Newcastle. Uh, <laughs> after about five games, if they're in a good position, I, I think the, uh, the cockerel will be crowing. Has he got the charisma of Harry, though? You know, putting arm Well, he hasn't got the. He certainly hasn't got the press in the palm of his hand like Harry had. From a personal point of view, um, Harry would um, speak to everybody and anybody at, at any time, and that can work for you and it can work against you. Harry had a very difficult year, a very tiring year physically. Um, he used to travel up from his home base and, and uh, uh, most uh, most times of the, during the week, he had the court case. Um, 
it, it wasn't easy for Harry. Harry's way into his 60s. So, um, it's, it, no, the, the bottom line is certainly, I would say 75% of the supporters at this moment, the perception would be, why, why, did, Harry, why did Harry leave? But obviously there's circumstances that no one knows, which is conducted between four walls, between the board and Harry. Um, and there was... And there might have been reasons why, where when Harry wanted a new contract, and maybe that had already been discussed. Certain inside things that uh, contributed to that decision, and uh, you know whether Harry was going to get the England job, wasn't going to get the England job, whether Harry was going to go to another country and work. I think there was all sorts of circumstances that people may not know, and no one might know for a long period of time. But um, they decided, in their wisdom, that the time was right. To done very well. Uh, you know, uh, Aston Villa did a similar thing, didn't they, with Martin O'Neill? Martin O'Neill had a bit of a fallout with the board at uh, Aston Villa, three times six position, which was very good on the surface, I thought. But Randy Lerner decided, for, for another inside reason, that they were spending too much money too readily, and uh, he wanted to cut the cloth accordingly. And it creates friction sometimes, and, and that's what happens in football. Well, tell me, the thing that worries me is, are they going to try to keep Modric, or is these new players coming in dependent on signing or selling Modric for 40, 35 million and using that money to buy new players? Because I'd, like, I'd love to hang on to him and go well, I think and e- buy new players. I think everyone would, but there's an ine- inevitability sometimes. When you have a very fine player, uh, young Hartson, who's coming on now, he heard Arsenal were interested in him, I sold him to Arsenal from Luton Town. Uh, you, once, they, once they know they can earn much more money... And once they can go to a club which in their perception is a bigger club, um, it's very difficult to stop. And now the salaries are so crazy and high that um, if someone can double their wages, like Van Persie at Arsenal, you'd have thought he would be more than happy to stay at Arsenal, see out his contract another year. But no, it looks as though he's manoeuvring himself to get a move to another club. Who are, might pay are you, are you saying the same with Modric? You're saying that he wants to move on for more yeah, money? Yeah, yes, I think I think Modric oh, right, is. Okay. I, I think Modric is. I think it's almost a fait accompli. I'd be very surprised if he stayed after what happened last summer when the chairman persuaded him to stay after Harry had suggested it might be better for him to leave. Yes. Gentlemen, I have to interrupt you there because we, as nice as it is, fantastic as it is to listen to you guys talking, we now have to listen to our commercial sponsors. But very briefly, it looks like Andy Murray and Joe Wilfred Zonga, it's going to go to a tie break. Currently locked at four apiece in the fourth set. Andy Murray, 2 1 up. Uh, we'll see you the other side of these messages. Ken Sports on Talk Radio Europe with the Friday Sports Bar. Well, good evening and welcome back to the Friday Night Sports Bar. I do apologise for the very long commercial break. We've been frantically trying to get uh, uh, John Hartson on the phone without much uh, success. But what I'll try and do is uh, try and bring him on uh, while we're having this conversation. Uh, Just before the commercial break, we were talking about Tottenham Hotspur uh, Football Club. Of course, one of your great rivals um, is across there at Arsenal. Um, Some big news coming from Robin Van Persie himself um, and his representatives uh, about uh, the fact that he he won't be renewing his contract, David. He still has one more year lying on his contract as well that he has to fulfil, but surely Arsenal will look at cashing in on, on him. Well, the problem is uh, Bosman had a, a, a case, of course. The players were kept under their contracts and couldn't be uh, allowed to leave at the expiration of the contracts. And players worked their rights. We had it at Tottenham. We had me and Sir Alan Sugar met many times with Sol Campbell. We could not get him to put his pen to paper. He just waited and waited and waited. George Graham kept playing him. Maybe if we left him out and uh, lost his England place, maybe he would have re-signed, who knows, or maybe he'd have seen it out. Tottenham supporters weren't very happy, obviously, but we lost the player, a top player. Clubs do lose top players. They got a year to go of his contract. It's a simple solution for Arsenal. If he wants to go, sell him now, maximise, because you are in the driving seat at this moment, maximise the fee, or... Take the loss. Have him for a year. Supporters won't be too happy, of course. I don't think so, unless he started the season very well and said he's sorry. And at the end of the season, you have a prized asset and he walks away to another club for nothing. And it is quite possible, though, if he waits another year and doesn't do so well this season, that club that's thinking of taking him now might not just be so interested. And that's a terrible gamble. It's like a precipice. You know, which way does it go? 
for, for, for Arsene Wenger, which way does it go? And from a business point of view, Arsene Wenger's made a habit of doing exceptionally good footballing business for Arsenal Football Club. Um, if they do decide to cash in on him, yet again, it's another uh, nice little profit made by the football club and Arsene Wenger. Well, he, he has made some incredible profits on certain players, particularly Vieira, uh, Overmars, they were the ones... And, and, and Elka was a big and, one, wasn't and it? And Elka was the biggest, yeah. of course. Getting him for nothing, kind of uh, seducing the player to come away from France for 500000 and then absolutely making a lot of money. And that's what set Arsenal off, really, on this run of Champions League games, which gives them every year qualification, which is fantastic. You know, a £10 million start on, on lots of rivals, including Tottenham, of course. But uh, you're quite right. He, you know, Van Persie has a right. You know, he has signed a contract. If he sees his contract out, they, they can't complain. But the supporters feel badly treated when their hero just walks away for nothing and, uh, or, or makes comments like he said at the moment, which appears to be, to be manoeuvring. And it doesn't matter what Usumov says or Kronke says. The players are in a very powerful position at the moment. This is true. I'm, I'm sure you want to comment on that, but we have a caller patiently waiting on the line, and thanks very much indeed for being patient, and welcome to the show. It's, sorry, it's Ali Meet Steve again. I've got another quickie question for you. Um, at the moment, you mentioned there's a lot of money in the game, and you were talking about the Tottenham manager being involved. My friend's a really strong Chelsea fan, and his comments were that... Uh, he couldn't control his players because they had more money than him. Do you feel that the players at Tottenham will give ABD the same sort of ride, bearing in mind they're all multi-millionaires and he's failed once already? Yeah, uh, well, I hope so, Steve. I think the problem is all managers or head coaches have that same problem. Very few have salaries that are anywhere near their top players. I think in the Premiership, probably Arsene Wenger, David Moyes, maybe now, and the Sir Alex Ferguson. So... You know, it, it's a problem that has grown. Many years ago, Brian Clough said uh, no player should earn more than the manager. The manager is the most important man at the club. And he, and he, and he should be if, if the club is run properly. But uh, the game has changed. The agents have forced the issue and the players now are in very powerful positions. You see people like Warren Barton, who sometimes doesn't behave that well. Um, you know, just accepting six-week fines where he's on probably, I don't know, X thousand pounds a week. And he... he He's happy to concede the fine but not behave well. The players are in a very powerful position and it's not easy. You're quite right. It won't be easy for AVB. He'll have occasional clashes but he has to, he has to work them out and live with them and, uh, and ride them. And, um, you, you know, it's, it's part of the manager's uh, job to, to cope with that situation which has emerged over the last few years. The reason why I ask you is if you've got 11 players like Balotelli who've got egos bigger than the planet and they're on more money, what would you do personally to, to uh, approve this situation? Well, the players will accept the Balotellis of this world if, on a regular basis, they help them win games. They won't worry about his off-field activities or how he copes with uh, certain circumstances. They will live with it. Um, sometimes a bad egg... They control them the best as possible. If that player, who's the bad character, isn't producing, then the players and the manager have to get them out. Because you've seen how important harmony is with the Spanish team. Uh, you see how important disharmony is, for example, with maybe with the Dutch team. And you've got to have spirit. Spirit can get you a long way. It doesn't win your games. You've got to have technical ability and good players. But spirit and endeavour are important. And if you've got a Balotelli who occasionally steps out of line and doesn't produce for the team either, then you must get him out. OK, thanks for, thanks for, your, for your advice. Pleasure. I'm watching the tennis, but I think Andy put in thanks, Steve, for that. Uh, thanks very much for, for your call again. And the, the breaking news is that Andy Murray has now gone through to the Wimbledon final. He's beaten Joe Wilfred Zonga, a chap he's had a very good record against in the past as well. So he'll be facing Roger Federer in the Wimbledon men's final. Tremendous result there for Andy Murray. Um, Stu, let's bring you in, of course. I know you've been waiting very... Uh, champing at the bit to, to get into David and have a bit of a chat about uh, Tottenham High Hotspur, a little bit more about your great passion in life. I just wanted to ask one thing. I mean, whenever I think of you, I always uh, remember in 1983 when you got that valuable last-minute equaliser against Manchester City, when you ran onto that pitch. I mean, that's a highlight that one will always remember. You were The excitement in, in you was just incredible. Uh, I, you know, I think people don't understand. They do kind of think about that and associate me with that. 
Um, I would suggest that there's been other other games which have been just as important, exciting, particularly some semi-finals, a final, a championship, a massive championship win where we only lost three games at Luton Town. But it was the years that built up to that situation, that couple of minutes of emotion. You know, we had continually got better in what was then Division 2. It was like to try and achieve to get in the Premiership. The previous year before we got promotion, we were beaten in the last game of the season by John Toshak's Swansea. And it was a terrible deflation. But the following year, we took the league by storm and won the Championship easily with about seven games to go. We beat Watford and we got promotion. And that following season, we had some marvellous games, including, including going to Liverpool and playing fantastically well, going 3-1 up and finally 3-3 it was fantastic game never ever forget it but come the end of the season we didn't look in trouble and then on the penultimate Saturday we got a bad result lost to Everton and four other teams which was kind of against the law of averages four teams all won who were in a worse position than us and so all of a sudden we were plunged into this terrible position where if we didn't get any points from our last two games, which were at Manchester United on the Monday and Manchester City on the Saturday, we would be relegated. After all those years of fighting and getting better and better and better. So the, to lose would be all the work undone. What happened to Man U? What was we it? lost. Oh, OK. And we expected to lose. I put two kids in and we lost the game at Manchester United, 2-0. So we knew it was everything to play for at Manchester City. We staked everything on it, that we could get something at Manchester City. And in three minutes to go, <coughs> it was an incredible game, the emotion, it was so many stories I could tell you about the day. Um, it was incredible. But with three minutes to go, my, my wife's father passed away two days before, which was also an emotion in the family. Um, it was everything building up, and with three minutes to go, my boy, my wonderful boy, Antich, who managed Real Madrid and Barcelona in, in subsequent years and has a place here in Marbella, Radi Antich scored with three minutes to go. You could, it was just like an explosion. And all of a sudden, we'd stayed up. And you just don't think. I just ran onto the field. I'm not supposed to run onto the field. And, and I may run onto the field with a funny run. I can't remember. <laughs> I didn't mean disrespectful I wasn't, when I said that. I wasn't that. Usain Bolt, for sure. No, no, no. And I was neither a marathon runner either. But that's the passion of football. That's I what you showed. And the strangest thing was, I hugged the captain, not the goal scorer. Strange, isn't it? It just shows you. Because I didn't know what I was doing. I, and I'll tell you another story. A policeman who was on duty that day, who was keeping the crowds back off the pitch at the end, is now the chief scout at Tottenham. That's how football works. <laughs> That's how football works. Yeah. But, but yes, it was an emotional day at Manchester City and we stayed in the division. Do you know what? We not only stayed in the division by winning that last game, but we stayed in the division on crowds of nobody for eight years, which was an incredible achievement. And Luton Town now aren't even in the Football League. They're yeah. out of the Football League. Yeah. So that was my whole success and career and enjoyment in my life. It was th those wonderful years at Luton where we, we built a team, one of the first teams to have five or six black boys in the team, all from more humble backgrounds who came and got better and better and better. And we, we were a very attractive team, I have to say that. We had some wonderful players. We had three players who came to me from other clubs, lower clubs, who all went on to play for England, the national team. It's a wonderful pride. Apart from other internationals like Donaghy, Grealish, many internationals, Steen, oh, loads of them. Do you go back to Luton? I mean, no, they're in the conference. I, saw two, I there. saw two games there last season. I was disappointed with the standard they are in the conference and they failed in the playoffs. Um, and uh, Luton was a very important part of my life. And... Um, um, uh, the football they play now is you just can't compare to the football we played but well, I had better players then um, but I, I think this year they're favourites at the moment to get back in the football league this coming season and I think they will do it I think for, for the first time they've probably got a manager who, who is, he managed at Torquay and Bristol Rovers I think, I think he's got enough drive and enough s common sense uh, with their budget to help them get back in the league I think they're, they're favourites 
and I, I think they'll do it this year. But the support they get, I mean, they're getting several thousand towards the end of the season. That's tremendous. Yeah, correct. Confidence. Well, they get six thousand in my time. We, you know, we went into the top league. We would probably get fifteen, sixteen, but we wouldn't get any more. Even our neighbours Watford, <laughs> who went up with us without all of Elton John's money behind them, you know, they got more crowds than us. We were the, we were the, the ultimate humble team. We were. David, your involvement in football today, it, it must continue. Somebody would want to u- utilise your enormous and amazing experience. Uh, so where does football take you these days? Well, it takes me all over the place at different times. I think two years ago, from, some friends here asked me to help with, uh, with Marbella. Uh, but that didn't come to that, that didn't come to fruition. I think I presented a shirt to someone on a pitch in one of the games, but I real, they realised I think that that financial involvement couldn't get them to where they wanted, or the project didn't take off. Um, at the moment, I'm doing a little bit of work with Tottenham, um, and um, the last few years I've helped Nottingham Forest as a consultant. Um, I've had a regular column in the Guardian newspaper in England for the last uh, five or six years, actually, a tactical analysis which kept my mind uh, moving and um, I do BBC radio uh, they're very kind to me I've been to many World Cups I did a lot of um, commentaries for BBC and then ITV on visual t- television um, but the last few years I've worked for Radio 5 a little bit which I enjoy I love the radio and um, I certainly enjoy going to good games big games and um, I was there at that very big game last year when sadly Muamba collapsed at Tottenham and that was a real test for me because for about seven minutes while he was down I was having to talk continually so that was a big one and um, so I've had a, quite a few experiences and I think I could write a few books perhaps <laughs> I'm sure you could and there'll be plenty of people out there wanting to buy them as well Stu because we're coming towards the end can I just ask David something it's very of course you can we've got, we've got about four minutes left okay. or so gentlemen so please going continue. from the Spurs because that's all I care about the season's yeah. coming I'm getting excited already yes. the first ten matches we've got we've got Newcastle away Manchester United away Chelsea at home the rest are medium middle of the road teams so we could get a decent start. What is your view of Spurs for this year? What, what do you look for? What do you think? Well, where, where, where can we go? Well, uh, certainly, if you look at Tottenham, not just the tradition, but the way the club is, you would hope to be in the top six. Everyone's fighting to be in the top six. The Liverpool supporter, Steve, would want his team to be in the top six at least. He thinks they should be back winning the league. It's not as easy as that. There are teams that are getting slightly better. Newcastle have bought well and therefore they're getting better. They're now to be considered. They weren't even being considered before. Manchester City have emerged as the biggest thing for a long time because of the finances. Chelsea will stay there because of what Avramovic has built up there. Arsenal will never be far away because of the organisation of the club and the professionalism of the club and the way they buy the players and bring them through. So, and Manchester United are bound to be a contender. We can't all win. What we can do is try and play attractive football and do our best to win at all times. Aston Villa might also have a word to say in the previous years, but last year they slipped. They may come back with Lambert as manager. I think it's going to be, one, once again, a fascinating season. You've seen how the television companies around the world are, are vying for premiership football. It's a great thrill for Scooter Moore to be sitting at a negotiating table and talking to these people and getting the money so high. My only worry is that the clubs will blow the money on further increases in salaries instead of keeping some back for the business. They must retain some for the business for less comfortable days. But aren't the laws changing now? uh, Well, let's go talk about financial fair play, but clubs have always found ways around those type of rules for example you had Manchester City financial fair play they're going to get naming rights for the stadium that doesn't come under the same heading that type of thing that uh, there is ways of maneuvering around that and we don't know how strong uh, a bladder is with the English club we we'll just have to see we'll, we'll give it time but for sure the clubs with the biggest crowds the clubs with what I call the most chimney pots in other words that can exploit success will continue to be the clubs that are most successful And now, if you look at the foreign backers in the Premiership, I was thinking the other day, how many English managers are there in the Premiership now? We've just had two move. Solbakken's gone to uh, Swansea, has he? I think so. Um, And we've had uh, Boas come back into Tottenham. Um, I don't think there's an English manager now. Sam Allardyce might be the only Premiership manager. I'm not sure of my facts here. But I wouldn't be surprised if he's the only English manager. So, so many things are changing so quickly. But all I know is, nothing. this won't change. The game is still played over the same length and width. 
the goalposts won't change shape and it'll just be as hard to win football matches because when you've been a manager you know how hard it is to win football matches and the relief when you win one is fantastic but it doesn't last for long the elation of winning is much less than the awful feeling that stays with you when you lose. So we, so. When we've been on a Saturday, I have a great weekend. If we lose on a Saturday, yeah, I am miserable. It's a, great, miserable. it's a great game, but you've got to win, and it's not easy to win. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned the word fantastic, and we've got about 40 seconds left, David, and it has been absolutely fantastic to have somebody like yourself in the studios with us this evening. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. More importantly, I hope all you listeners out there have enjoyed it. I know Stuart Joseph has en- enjoyed it very much as well. We've had Maureen, his lovely wife, waiting patiently on the sofa. She's probably had to do that a number of times with your media commitments uh, in the past and also sincere apologies that we didn't get John on the phone uh, some problems there with his line we will get him on in the future but David uh, very much appreciated Thank to you. have you on the uh, show this wish evening the, wish the station well thanks very much and Stu obviously it was great to have you here again and I'm sure you enjoyed that great evening this have a great sporting weekend Talk Radio Europe on the hour live international news from Sky brought to you by Yuska Bank Gibraltar for all your investment and banking needs Last few minutes, Andy Murray's become the first British player to make it to the finals of Wimbledon's men's singles since 1938. Simon Owen has more from Centre Court. And what a moment for British sports here. Andy Murray blinking back tears and looking to the sky after sealing victory. He beat Joe Wilfred Songa in four sets to do it. Murray powerful, accurate, on top form. And I'll tell you what, playing like this, he has a great chance of going one step further. He'll play Roger Federer for the Wimbledon. Wimbledon title on Sunday. A mother found guilty of poisoning her baby daughter with a powerful painkiller has been jailed for life. 34-year-old Michelle Smith from Swansea will serve at least 12 years for the murder of six-week-old Amy. Torrential rain has caused disruption across large parts of the UK. The Environment Agency has issued 50 flood warnings and 125 flood alerts for England and Wales. Forecasters predict a month's worth of rain will fall in just 24 hours. Alison Hughes's home in Lancashire was flooded only two weeks ago and she's worried it may happen again. I'm absolutely petrified we're going to get flooded again in the next 24 hours. We haven't even finished cleaning up from last time, you know, the smell and everything's still here, so I'm just terrified. A criminal investigation has been launched into allegations that interest rate fixing was widespread within the banking industry. The Serious Fraud Office is heading up the inquiry after Barclays was fined nearly £300 million in the scandal. A reference to the man who killed the head teacher Philip Lawrence has been removed from a video made by Dappy. The rapper's also said sorry after saying Leo Chindamu should be freed in the opening credits of his single. And Andrew Lloyd Webber's teaming up with Gary Barlow again to pen another song after the success of their Diamond Jubilee theme. The Phantom of the Opera composer says he's already come up with a tune and is waiting on the title from the Take That star. That's the latest. I'm Cat Collins. <laughs> The international news live on the hour from Sky in association with Yiska Bank Gibraltar. For all your investments and banking needs, go online to yiskabank.gi, J-Y-S-K-E bank dot G-I, or visit us at 76 Main Street, Gibraltar. Yiska Bank, for all your investment and banking needs. Be a part of the Global Expat Network. Join the millions of people using angloinfo.com every day. AngloInfo has a truly global reach with a local focus, working within each community to provide information and support.